Today we're going to talk about reason, Republicans, and the future of freedom. And I know that some of you are thinking, hmm, one of these things does not belong. And you're absolutely right, and that's why we're talking about this today. Because right now in America, there are two ideologies that are warring for the minds of Americans. These are, well, the first is, we're all too familiar with it, wokeism, the view that one's identity group is the source of truth and moral concern, and that its interests are served by creating narratives to gain power over other groups. So this comes from Marxism, from postmodernism, from critical race theory, social justice activism. It's the idea that language or narratives is a form of power that is used to subjugate other groups, to keep them ensconced in a, uh, in, in a false ideology, a false consciousness, as Frederick Engels put it, right? But this is a toxic ideology, and it must go. And one of the, one of the competing ideologies that is seeking to unseat it is national conservatism. And I know that we heard about this a bit last night, right? <clears throat> and they said their title was, Everything Wrong with National Conservatism. Well, you know, it's unfortunately just a fact that in 30 minutes, it's not nearly enough time to cover that everything that's wrong with national conservatism, because there's so many things wrong with it. So this is the view that one's nation is the source of truth and the unit of moral concern, and that the nation's interests are served by conserving traditions, primarily religion, that provide the nation with stability to withstand encroachments from rival groups. And this is an ancient ideology but it's been given new life in the form of some very systematic intellectual support by this man, Yoram Hazoni. It's got The Virtue of Nationalism, which came out in 2019, and Conservatism, A Rediscovery, 2022. So we're gonna focus mostly on Hazoni today, but I think it's worth pointing out that he's not some lone wolf ivory tower, ivory tower intellectual. He has serious traction in the culture heads of think tanks, heads of colleges, journalists at all of these publications, and a whole bunch of Republicans, and even people in the military. All these guys, Josh Hawley, Marco Rubio, Ron DeSantis, all of these guys spoke at the National Conservatism Conference that happened about a month ago just down the road from here. So we know that conservatism has long influenced the Republican Party, right? And with this new influx of intellectual support that's only going to increase, we really need to know what these ideas are and, if need be, how to respond to them. Today we're going to cover three fundamentals of national conservatism. This is my opinion. This is what I think national conservatism is. You guys should go out, read these books. If you don't want to support him by buying them, just go to your local library, pick them up. Read these books because they're, they're going to change the nature of America and possibly the world if we don't know how to counter these ideas. So the first is that knowledge is produced by collectives, not individuals. The second, the collective or nation, not the individual, is the unit of moral concern. And the third, the purpose of government is to conserve the nation by cultivating loyalty and coercing individuals when necessary. So the, the basic idea of national conservatism is right there in the title, to conserve the nation. But we're going to break down its fundamentals and talk about why they're, I think, very dangerous. Before we dive in, let's look at the views on knowledge that Hazoni and company explicitly reject. Views on politics and also, to some extent, the underlying views on knowledge itself. So he explicitly rejects Enlightenment liberalism and some of the basic tenets of, of Enlightenment theory of knowledge. <clears throat> Those tenets include the fact that each of us has perceptual faculties that we can observe things in the world, understand the world, come to our own conclusions about it, and sometimes those conclusions might be of such breadth that they're actually universal conclusions. So for instance, Galileo discovered that the Earth revolves around the sun, not vice versa, which was long, long held. Isaac Newton discovered mathematical truths that explain natural phenomena. And Benjamin Franklin integrated disparate observations of electricity into a unified scientific theory. Among the Enlightenment thinkers were some who turned the scientific bent of mind on man himself, on understanding his means of knowledge, understanding ethics, and the proper purpose of government. And of course, key among these was John Locke. We all know John Locke's two treatises of government, right? The basis of 
the American founding. What most of us don't know is that before he wrote the two treatises of government, he wrote another book that basically held all the opposite views. And this was called The Two Tracts on Government. And to understand why Locke held these views, we have to understand his context. Between the time that Locke was 10 and the time that he was 30, England underwent three civil wars, executed a monarch, and prosecuted a variety of other carnage, all in the name of religious conflict. And Locke, not bizarrely, came to the conclusion that it is impossible for people of different religious beliefs to live peacefully amongst one another. What they do, he wrote in the two tracts on government, when they form a society, what they do is they agree to give up their rights to a magistrate who has final say on all things civil and religious. So you can think of this Lockean magistrate in the two tracts as essentially Ayatollah Khomeini in Iran today. But Locke was awestruck when a little later he traveled to Cleves in modern Germany, and he saw there people of a bunch of different religious persuasions all living peacefully, working peacefully amongst each other. How could that be? Calvinists, Catholics, Lutherans? He came to the conclusion that the problem back in England was not that different people were trying to live amongst one another while believing different religions. The problem was that some tried to propagate their beliefs by the force of arms. And he concluded that such is the nature of the understanding that nothing can compel it to the belief of anything by outward force. And this, of course, was the idea that was baked into the American founding that each of us must be free to think for ourselves, to act on our judgment, to live the lives that we seek to live, to pursue our own happiness. And this is the view that Hazoni thinks is absolute hubris, that we could somehow understand principles, moral and political, that apply to all people in all places at all times. Universal truths in the realms of morals and politics, he thinks, cannot be divined by individuals thinking for themselves. No, he says. We have to be rational. We have to go by the evidence of experience. Experience tells us that people live in different paradigms, they have different beliefs, different religions, and <clears throat> they are all gonna come to different ideas. He says, I'm not a relativist. Oh, whoa, whoa, slow your roll. I'm not a relativist. I just don't believe that the individual can come to these conclusions for himself, to come to these universal moral and political truths, right? The individual is born into a tradition, and he has to seek within that tradition for the, for the truth. So we don't seek the truth by going by your experience or your experience or John Locke's experience. We seek truth within the experience of the collective, the tradition that we're born into. He says, rather than conducting his own search for truth in a manner that is largely independent of what others believe and do, the conservative finds that human beings conduct their search for truth as members of a tradition. The tradition equips the individual with a point of departure in a discourse moderated by persons who have the standing to reframe ideas and principles and to introduce larger repairs when needed. <clears throat> By the way, I'm going to read some quotes to you from Hazoni because there's just simply no way for me to convey his ideas better than he does in his own words. He's a very clear writer. He's done us a, a good service of actually presenting these ideas extremely clearly, unlike people like Jordan Peterson, for instance. So who has standing in society? Well, he says, we're born into these hierarchies of families, clans, and tribes, and we have to honor those above us in this hierarchy. But innovators can console themselves with this. If you have a new idea, well, listen to this. Less prominent figures also introduce improvements into the tradition, but these carry far less weight and tend to be ignored unless they attract the endorsements of important persons within the hierarchy. So if you have a great new idea, run up the flagpole. What you don't want to do is think for yourself, look at reality, you want to look primarily at what other people think. So moving on to the national conservative's view of morality, the collective or nation, not the individuals, the units of moral concern. What about the Enlightenment view of the pursuit of your own happiness? This, says Hazoni, leads to moral and most importantly, social decay, the dissolution of the nation, the lack of cohesion. He says, look around. We've been so focused on freedom for so long. And look at where it's led us. 
Look at the world today. This is the result of focusing on individual rights. <clears throat> individual rights are important, he says, but we got to remember this. Under the present conditions of permanent revolution and cultural devastation, the most important thing to remember about individual liberties is that in and of themselves, they have no power to make anything stable or permanent. Stability of the nation is the standard of moral value on Hazoni's view. It's the standard of moral value. Every action has to be evaluated on the grounds of whether or not it conserves the nation or leads to its dissolution. A conservative political theory begins with the understanding that individuals are born into families, tribes, and nations to which they are bound by mutual loyalty. This means that a conservative recognizes the nation as an ineliminable reality, the nation as an ineliminable reality. And we have to maintain the stability and the permanence of that nation and morality by cultivating deference and honor to those above us in the hierarchies that we're born into. And we do this primarily by promoting religion via support by the state. The state must honor religion. <clears throat> so you see his moral views quickly lead into political views because basically he thinks morality has to do with how we interact with other people. It has nothing to tell us about leading beautiful lives ourselves as individuals. So we quickly move along to government. The purpose of government is to conserve the nation by cultivating loyalty and coercing individuals when necessary. <clears throat> so you've probably already seen a bit of this, a bit of the wokeism that we talked about earlier, of this group mentality, right? And he actually acknowledges the common root here. He says, Marxist political theory is not simply a great lie. By analyzing society in terms of power relations among classes or groups, we can bring to light important political phenomena to which Enlightenment liberal theories, theories that tend to reduce politics to the individual and his or her private liberties, are systematically blind. What is it we're blind to? We're blind to the fact that in politics equals pressure group warfare. So we're kind of right back where we started with the wokists, right? And rights, he says, are not principles that we can use to discern how to act properly within a society. Rights are the spoils of war in this pressure group warfare. Rights are the things that government grants to one group at the expense of other groups. So they're government-granted privileges, and those privileges are granted for the purpose of conserving the nation, for quelling any sort of thoughts of rebellions. So the only thing that Marx got wrong on Hazoni's view is the idea that the dominant group is always the oppressor. Now he says, often the dominant group can be really good for the group that's dominated. And this is strikingly similar to the argument that the Southern Democrats gave to justify slavery in the run-up to the Civil War. We don't have time to go into that, but it's worth noting. So just a, an example of his views on rights here. A right not to be called to war, not to be drafted into the army. Right? A right not to be called to war can only exist potentially in a society whose armed forces are strong enough and whose neighbors are peaceable enough to permit such a guarantee to be made good. And the same can be said of many other universal rights that have been asserted over the last two centuries without considering whether the resources exist to make them available. So rights, it's all about pragmatism. It's all about figuring out how can we shuffle things around to make this group happy at the expense of this group who's a little less prominent, maybe a weaker group. They don't have as much clout on the political scene. <clears throat> so these are the fundamentals of national conservatism. How should we respond to these ideas? The idea that knowledge is produced by collectives, not individuals. Let's start with that one. Well, this is pretty simple, right? Neither the number of people who believe in an idea nor their status within some hierarchy has any bearing whatsoever on the truth or falsity of that idea. And a very clear empirical example of this is Galileo. The hubris, the temerity of Galileo to hold against millennia of tradition, against the entire hierarchy of tradition, against the Roman Inquisition that the earth revolves around the sun and not vice versa. The hubris of this man. What should he have done? He should have run his idea up the flagpole, tried to get buy-in from other people, right? <clears throat> this, of course, is just absolutely absurd. And it's a perfect description of what Ayn Rand called second-handedness, the idea that 
We derive truth not by our own perception of the facts of reality, but through looking to the opinions of other people. Rand said that this is a form of faith or mysticism because it's a form of believing things without evidence. In the absence of evidence, we believe things because other people say that they're true. She said, a mystic is a man who surrendered his mind at its first encounter with the minds of others. When his own understanding of reality clashed with the assertions of others, with their arbitrary orders and contradictory demands, he gave in to so craven a fear of independence that he renounced his rational faculty. At the crossroads of the choice between I know and they say, he chose the authority of others. He chose to submit rather than to understand, to believe rather than to think. So should we honor those people who are so craven to give into a fear of independence? Or should we honor the independent thinkers? The independent thinkers are the reason that we could all get on planes and come here to be together for this conference. The independent thinkers are the reason that we're walking around with supercomputers in our pockets with which to access the world's information and entertainment. The independent thinkers do not tell us defer and obey. They tell us dare to think different. They're the reason that we're infinitely more wealthy than we were two centuries ago. They're the reason that my 93-year-old grandmother didn't die at the age of 20 or 30. The independent thinkers are the heroes that we opt to uphold as exemplars to mankind, not those who give in to this craven fear of independence, this inability to think for themselves. Let's turn now to the morality and politics of national conservatism, and we can take these in one fell swoop because they both involve the same basic error, which is collectivism. The idea that the collective is more important than the, than the individual. The collective, the nation, is the ineliminable reality, not the individual, right? <clears throat> but this is false. <clears throat> it relies on a theory of morality called altruism, the idea that others, serving others, is the only moral consideration. And we saw this with Zizoni's morality. It goes directly to the social level. The basic principle of altruism, said Rand, is that man has no right to exist for his own sake, that service to others is the only justification of his existence, and that self-sacrifice is his highest moral duty, virtue, and value. This is the idea upon which Putin conscripts hundreds of thousands of Russians to send them to the front line to die in unjust war for the honor of the nation. This is the idea upon which a regime is motivated to kill a 22-year-old girl for the temerity of breaking a dress code meant to conserve the morality and stability of the nation. But collectivism is observably false. We can look at the facts of reality and see this. This is exactly what Frederick Douglass did in a letter to his former slave master. He said, I am not by nature bound to you or you to me. Nature does not make your existence depend upon me or mine to depend upon yours. I cannot walk on your legs or you on mine. I cannot breathe for you or you for me. I must breathe for myself and you for yourself. We are distinct persons and are each equally provided with faculties necessary to our individual existence. And what did he do with those faculties? What did he do with those legs that his master could not walk on but he could? Did he defer to the tradition and the hierarchy, hierarchy that he's born into? Hell no. He escaped to freedom. He pursued his own rational self-interest. He pursued his own happiness to build a beautiful life for himself. And that is profoundly moral. Nor is the purpose of government to conserve the nation. No, the purpose of government as our founders rightly understood is to secure our individual rights. Rights are not claims to goods or services provided by other people. They're not the spoils of pressure group warfare. Rights are principles recognizing the fact that each of us has the ability to perceive the world, to understand the world for ourselves, to come to our own conclusions. We must be free to act on our own judgment, to live our lives as we see fit, so long as we don't violate the equal rights of other people. Pizzoni's entire historical case against Enlightenment liberalism falls completely flat because he accepts the progressive misconception of rights 
as privileges. He makes no distinction between the Enlightenment idea of classical liberalism and the progressive idea of liberalism. The idea that progressives tried to uh, really obliterate the idea of rights and replace it with the idea of rights as, as privileges. He accepts that idea hook, line, and sinker, and it's absolutely false. So I think if we boil national conservatism down to its basic fundamentals, it comes down to mysticism, the idea that others are the source of truth, that we ought to believe things in the absence of evidence, to altruism, the idea that we should live our lives not for our own sake, not in pursuit of our own happiness, but for the good of others. And collectivism, the idea that if the individual doesn't want to do that, the state can force him to, because the unit of moral concern, again, is the stability of the nation, not the individual's pursuit of his own happiness. If we want a future <clears throat> of freedom and flourishing, then we have to reject all of these basic ideas. And we have to replace them with the ideas that actually lead to freedom. These ideas undergird not only wokeism, the wokeism that Hazoni seeks to actually counter, they undergird every statist regime, every dictatorship in history. If we want freedom and flourishing, we need reason. We need to recognize reason as man's only means of knowledge. Rational self-interest <clears throat> as the moral purpose of his life and individualism, the idea of the individual should pursue his own good and that at the political level we have to protect his right to do so. This not wokeism, not national conservatism, is the path to freedom. Thank you. <clears throat>